account. I am Dr. Muhammad Ali Rabani, I'm part two resident of FCBS Anatomy, and today on the forum of Medicos Academics, we are going to discuss the part one anatomy questions related to both upper and lower limbs. For the purpose of this particular video, we are going to discuss questions from medicine and allied component of SK Golden 9. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. If I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulder of the joints. So uh, this video has been made possible with the help of content and illustrations obtained from other sources. I do not claim ownership of any of the content illustration that is not mine and due credit will be given to the original source to the best of my ability wherever it is required. So today we are going to discuss uh, the topics of upper and lower limb and uh, we will go in the regional manner from the girdle to toes and that in for both the upper and lower limbs so for the upper limbs let's start with pectoral girdle that's a component of osteology a diabetic with quadrigeminal abscess loss of shoulder movement and uh, there is a abscess in the quad quadrilateral space or quadrigeminal so quadrigeminal abscess means the abscess in the quadrilateral space and there is a loss of shoulder movement the nerve involved for this purpose you should know the three a quadrilateral space, upper and lower triangular space and the contents between them. So the here answer is axillary nerve. By the way, this is one of the most frequently asked questions. So here is the quadrilateral space, so below teres major, above teres minor and subscapularis, laterally there is humerus, medially long head of triceps. And in this component, in this particular rectangular space, there is posterior circumflex humeral artery and axillary nerve. Here it has been asked in the backdrop of quadrilateral abscess but it is also asked in the uh, clinical scenario of downward dislocation of shoulder joint because as the head of the shoulder joint it comes down these two structures get involved so the RT is also asked in some of the MCQs and the other is upper triangular space it contains circumflex scapular artery lower triangular space it contains profunda brachii artery and radial nerve a vein that transverses through the clavipectoral fascia and pierces fascia later to the axillary nerve. So, clavipectoral triangle is here. On one side there is deltoid, other side there is pectoralis major, and on the third side there is clavicle. And the, the vein that pierces this point is the syphonic vein. We will discuss this vein in the end when uh, we will discuss official veins and lymphatics. So, here it enters the clavicular fascia and it enters from the lateral aspect of the axillary vein. So the answer would be cephalic vein. Um, so uh, here the answer is cephalic vein and uh, the other vein is the basilic vein. Basilic vein is on the medial aspect of the arm. It uh, drains from the little finger, continues onto the medial aspect and ultimately it dips down the deep fascia at the middle of the brachium, at the middle of the arm and it uh, goes down and joins the axillary vein. So, this particular question, the answer is cephalic vein. Axilla and contents, the extension of the arm is supplied by. So, extension of the arm that is occurred by tricep. So, tricep is supplied by radial nerve and radial nerve is coming from the posterior cord of brachial plexus. I can't stress this enough, you have to learn brachial plexus by heart. All of the questions of the upper limb related to nerves, ultimately they converge on the brachial plexus. First, you should know the muscles, their actions, their nerve supply. Then you should go and learn the brachial plexus. Um, I would suggest that you don't memorize all of the brachial plexus at once. First, you should do the muscle and their functions and the nerve supply. Then go back and learn the brachial plexus. Because a lot of questions are there. Brachial plexus is asked left and right and in any way that is possible. So here, the answer would be posterior cord of brachial plexus because it leads to the injury of radial nerve and along with that axillary nerve and due to that the whole of the extension of the arm will be lost. Posterior fibers of deltoid will not be working, triceps will not be working and a person cannot extend his arm. Unenough lesion will result in. So unenough and there is a loss of sensory supply of medial one third of palm and dorsum. This treatment is correct. Loss of thin arm muscle, no. And sensation is done by medial nerve. Loss of two third sensation of the hand no, lateral it is less lateral one third and wrist drop, no wrist drop is done to the radial nerve. So here you can see that the shown in blue, this sensation one and a half finger in front, two and a half finger on the back, almost one third on the lateral aspect. Uh, this is 
so medial aspect little finger is medial uh, medial aspect it is uh, on a nerve a person cannot flex index finger after bullet injury somewhere near axilla axilla shows no fracture the nerve impulse so for the flexion of the fingers you need flexor digitorum flexor digitorum superficial is flexor digitorum profundus flexor digitorum superficial is being supplied by the median nerve flexor digitorum profundus is supplied by both median and ulnar nerve flexor digitorum profundus uh, the fibers that are ultimately supplying the index and mid middle finger these are being supplied by median nerve so if median nerve is damaged the complete flexion will, will be lost for the index finger so here the answer will be median nerve so here this flexor digitorum superficialis is paralyzed and flexor digitorum profundus lateral half that is playing that these two digits index and middle these are being paralyzed and by the way you should also know that this clinical sign is known as benedict hand because in this particular case when you ask the person to make a fist of his hand he cannot fix he cannot flex the index and middle finger the other two fingers they curl down due to the presence of flexor digitorum profundus functioning but the index and middle finger they do not um, curl and it's like the benedict hand like when the pope is given the blessing arm and brachium the difficulty in walking brisk ankle reflex knee reflex and absent bicep reflex so if there is absent bicep reflex but uh, this absent bicep reflex means there is a lower motor neuron type lesion there is a brisk ankle and knee reflex it is means the upper motor neuron type lesion it means that wherever the lesion it is at the level of the reflex of bicep for this purpose you should be very good at memorizing all the deep tendon reflexes root values the bicep one the triceps your knee reflex um, there is uh, uh, the other ones are given also the finger jerk reflex and even the superficial for the head and neck cranial nerve reflexes also i discussed in the head and neck video so this particular bicep reflex is from the c5 and c6 bicep tendon so it is a correct answer you should know all of the other reflexes if they are given less you should remember all the other reflexes also that includes the ankle the knee and uh, then there is even supinate reflex has been asked so the root values of the major reflexes has been asked repetitively a patient after trauma to the arm develop uh, root of the thumb and now numb and now unable to open his hand which nerve is damaged so root of the thumb um, you can say the root of the thumb is anteriorly posteriorly whatever you are asking both of these are supplied by different nerves anteriorly it is being supplied by median nerve posteriorly it is being supplied by the radial nerve so of which nerve are they talking about this clue is given in the next question he is unable to open the hand so just like the closing of the hand was with the help of flexors the opening of the hand is with the help of extensors so extensor digitorum extensor pollicis all of these are being supplied by the radial nerve so the radial nerve answer question answer it satisfy both uh, the problems here the injury to the root of the thumb we are not talking about the back now we know that and unable to open the hand so the uh, that will be radial nerve so radial nerve is on the posterior aspect extensor digitorum or are being supplied it does not allow the opening of hand and here the root of the thumb on the posterior aspect is being supplied with superficial branch of radial nerve now supplying the muscles causes supination so two of the muscles are very important in supination supinator muscle itself in the forearm it is being supplied by the radial nerve and the other one is the bicep brachii by the way people tend to forget that bicep brachii is a powerful supinator and cpsp takes advantage of that and asks a lot of questions where in the supination the answer is bicep brachii so keep that in mind so musculoskeletal so biceps is being supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve and the supinator here is the supinator muscle you see this is a pronated arm supinator get folded and when it contracts it brings the arm into the straight anatomical position in the supination so biceps brachii is being supplied by the musculocutaneous and supinator itself is being supplied by the radial nerve median nerve in upper arm which statement is correct median nerve is lateral epicondyle of the humerus no it is not related to that it is medial to the brachial artery in cubital fossa yes this particular statement is correct lateral to the brachial artery in the cubital fossa no it is not medial epicondyle of the humerus no it is not related to the medial epicondyle of the humerus so here it is related to the medial to the brachial artery by the way you should remember the relation of the structures of the cubital fossa mbbr median nerve brachial artery biceps tendon radial nerve i will repeat mbbr medial nerve 
brachial artery, bicep tendon, head and nerve. So these relations are asked frequently as it has been asked in this particular question. A supinator damage, supinator injury, the same the thing I just said a uh, slide ago. If supinator is damaged, the rest of the muscle that takes up the supination is the biceps brachii. So biceps brachii is the one that takes up the supination. Here you can see that it is in the pronated form. When there is supination, this radial tuberosity it goes down. So biceps tendon helps to pull back in the supinated position. Radial artery it is present in. Radial artery it starts off. Um, in actually speaking, this state question is not very uh, well made. Radial artery it actually started in the cubital fossa and it is present on the lateral aspect of the forearm. So here all of these options are not correct if you talk about the radial artery. It is, but uh, if we take it radial nerve then one of the option is correct. Then a radial nerve it is present in the spiral. It passes through the lower triangular space then spiral groove then in the cubital fossa and then moves on to the forearm and then through the supinator it goes to the back of the arm. So it should be here that radial nerve is present in the radial group. By the way, if um, I think you should correct it on that book, the, uh, the question for the radial nerve. If the question was radial artery, the radial artery it starts in the cubital fossa as a terminal branch of the radial artery. And then from that it moves in the anterior compartment of forearm uh, on the lateral aspect. Just near the wrist, it goes laterally, it winds around the radius bone, moves to the base of the anatomical snuff box and ultimately it enters the hand between the two heads of first dorsal intrusia. But that's not our topic, so I'm not going to the detail, but here I should, uh, I'll try to remind that this question itself is not accurate. So this is the question and the source has been given correct that the correct answer will be for the radial nerve. The wrist drop is caused by the damage of one of the favorite questions. The wrist drop is done when there is paralysis of the mus extensor muscles of the forearm. Extensor muscles of the forearm are being supplied by the radial nerve. So the radial nerve here it is being supplied by the radial nerve for extensor compartment of the forearm when these basically they get paralyzed the chief muscle that result in the wrist drop are the extensor carpi radialis, extensor carpi ulnaris and these leads to the loss of extension function at the wrist joint and that is interpreted as wrist drop. Now supplying the muscle causing supination. Same question bicep by musculocutaneous and supinator itself by radial nerve. So these are being asked uh, again. So actually another question that is sometimes asked the radial nerve when it moves from the cubital fossa to back of the forearm it passes through the substance of the radial uh, supinator muscle by the way for the upper arm limb you should know the muscles through which nerves passes radial nerve is passing through supinator median nerve it at the level of cubital fossa it passes between the two head of pronator teres and where their pronator syndrome occurs and ulnar nerve just as it passes crosses the medial epicondyle posteriorly it passes between the two head of flexor carpi ulnaris and by the way the space between two heads of flexor carpi ulnaris and medial epicondyle that is known as medial cubital um, canal medial cubital tunnel cubital tunnel simply speaking and cubital tunnel should be differentiated from carpal tunnel carpal tunnel is the one that is at the level of wrist in front below the flexor retinaculum and carpal tunnel leads to the injury of median nerve hook of hemate injury so hook of hemate which nerve is related to that ulnar nerve is related to that ulnar nerve when it passes through the wrist it passes between the pc form and hook of hemate so here when there is hook of hemate injury it leads to the injury of the ulnar nerve thinar muscles are supplied by three out of four muscles of thinar are being supplied by the median nerve so the answer will be median nerve and by the way you should remember the muscle that are being supplied by the median nerve in hand there are three thinar muscles, flexor, abductor and opponus pollicis brevis and then there are two lumbricals on the first and second lumbricals. All of the other muscles of the hand are being supplied by the ulnar nerve and median nerve supplies all of the muscles of the forearm except one and a half muscle. One muscle is flexor carpi ulnaris that is being supplied by the ulnar nerve. The other half of the muscle is the lateral half, the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus. 
obese person makes edema thinner loss of uh, thinner loss of lateral sensations so mixed edema means uh, mixed edema there is edema when there is edema there is compartment syndrome in the tight compartments and thinner muscles and the skin over thinner muscle was being spread by the median nerve so it is carpal tunnel syndrome so the answer is carpal tunnel syndrome here so the um, it is being trapped here in the carpal tunnel by the way cubital tunnel is a real thing and cubital tunnel you should know that cubital tunnel is between the two heads of flexor carpi ulnaris and it leads to the entrapment of ulnar and tarsal tunnel is again a real thing it is behind the medial mellulus and the things that are going from posterior compartment of leg into the sole of the foot that passes through that the most important being the posterior tibial artery and tibial nerve there so these are all the questions that were in the 10 papers of medicine in a height in sk golden 9 moving on to the lower limb uh, a little less asked as compared to the upper limb so let's see what kind of questions are asked here an 11 year old girl came to radiology department but his structure is lost to ossify i know this question is pain in the leg uh, but uh, this type of questions sometime appear and uh, you can do something about question like this but what you can do is that uh, you can uh, scan the past papers and look for the questions that are asked you correctly so this is a picture from British Russia you can see that the ossification center that is appeared the last is at the lateral epicondyle it is in the 12th year the medial epicondyle it is in the 9th year shaft itself it appears earlier the uh, it has appeared actually in, as the primary ossification center even in the entire uterine life and uh, then there is angle angle there is actually no angle of the humerus actually so uh, this is the answer uh, the lateral epicondyle head of the femur is subnanimate this is actually a tricky question and uh, often not completely asked the correct answer is medial and lateral circumflex artery let me explain it to you in a little more uh, first let me show you what happens in a child in a child in a young person there is here epiphyseal cartilage between neck and head and the important thing to know about the epiphyseal cartilage is that no blood vessels cross it and the blood supply on one side remains on that side and the other side does not communicate with the first one so what happens is that in a young child in a young child both of them must have their separate um, blood supplies so that is what is happening in a young person so in a young person the head is being supplied by the acetabular branch of obturator artery. So it is being supplied by acetabular branch of obturator artery. So and it artery it comes from the ligament of head of teres, ligament of head of femur um, in the acetabular fossa. And the neck and trochanters they are being supplied by the trochanteric anastomosis. The most important contributors being the medial circumflex femoral artery followed by lateral circumflex femoral artery. So if one artery is asked, it is medial circumflex femoral artery, two arteries are asked are medial and lateral circumflex femoral artery. They form a trochanteric anastomosis and through retinacular arteries, if they enter the capsule and they supply the neck. So this is for the child. Head is supplying by a stapler branch of obturator. Neck is supplied by retinacular arteries that are coming from trochanteric anastomosis. Most important being medial circumflex femoral and lateral circumflex femoral arteries in that order. What happened in adults? In adult, when a person grows, he the epiphyseal cartilage it disappears and the bone ossifies. When the bone of ossifies, the head meets the neck. Now there is no restriction for the arteries. So now the arteries they grow across this line and they move on to the head region also. These arteries they grow all the way through the head into the uh, neck into the head region. Now now the head is getting copious blood supply from the the blood vessels that were previously supplying the neck now this head region does not need a separate blood supply from the obturator artery so as a person grows old even in the especially in the old people this stabular branch it regresses and it eventually it vanishes in the old people there is no artery in the old people in this here so here if the head of the femur is asked for the old person it is being supplied by the medial and lateral circumflex femoral artery due to the reason we just said if the asked is specifically asked 
that head is being supplied in a five year old person then it is being supplied by the obturator artery stabilizer branch so here no age is given so we will consider is a as a adult male adult person so here the answer will be median and latent circumflex femoral artery now let's take this to the next level the same question take it to the next level if there is a 70 year old person is a um, um, don't mind my beautiful drawing if there is a 70 year old person and 70 year old person has a hip dislocation when there is hip dislocation it moves here and when hip moves here this ligament it tears when there is a hip dislocation and the uh, this ligament tear this arterial supply it disrupts but as you know in 17 year old this arterial supply is not so important after all so what happens is the head does not get necrosed but the same 70 year old person there is no uh, dislocation but here is a fracture in a 70 year old person now what happens is that this part of the head that was actually now in 70 year old person it is being supplied by the retinacular arteries this is supply is interrupted by that time the supply of the acetabular branch it had regressed and it is not sufficient so what happens is in the neck fracture of the femur the head get necrosed so this is question frequently asked in in the the head get necrosed in which scenario in the fracture of the neck or the dislocation so in for a 70 year old person the head remains white or alive in the dislocation but it gets necrosed in the fracture now let's consider this is a seven year old person now the story is different in a seven year old person there is epiphyseal cartilage here the blood supplies are separate so if a seven year old person has a fracture here the head does not get necrosed because the blood continued to supply from obturator artery and the neck gets continued supplied from these trochanteric kenastomosis so a seven year old person supplies escapes necrosis due to the dual supply but the same person the same seven year old if his head gets dislocated when it gets dislocated this artery will be cut off a stabular branch will not supply this artery cannot move further into the head region so this region will get necrosed so whenever you are asked about if the head will get necrosed in the dislocation or fracture be vigilant to look for the age in an old person in an old person uh, the fracture leads to the necrosis in an old person dislocation does not lead to the necrosis in a young person fracture leads does not lead to the necrosis in a young person dislocation leads to the necrosis i hope so you have now it on record you can play it again and this is an important concept and you should know that if the age is not given in the question you should always assume we are talking about an adult person and an old person so if it is not specifically asked about a child don't go there flexor at hip and knee joint a lot of questions are asked about uh, the muscle functions at the level of thigh especially flexor at hip and knee joint only one muscle it does that it is sartorius muscle it is like when a tailor sits on the ground and crosses his legs so there is a flexion at hip joint flexion at knee joint hip extension without knee flexion all the hamstrings they do the hip flexion at the same uh, extension at the same time they do the knee flexion but which of the following does not do so so here semitendinosus semitendinosus is actually not a very good answer the correct answer here should be adductor magna even that that is even not a very good uh, yes adductor magnus is a good answer um, um, i'll suggest that you correct that on your uh, books why adductor magnus adductor magnus is originating from the femur and uh, it is originally uh, originating from the ischial tuberosities and from the femur and it is inserting on the femur 
its insertion does not go to the knee if its insertion does not go to the knee it will not have any role in playing in the flexion of the knee so it only plays the extension of hip function at the level of hip joint but is that no play function at the level of knee joint so um, in my humble opinion adductor magnus is the correct answer semi membranosus and tendinosus both of them they do provide extension at hip and flexion at the knee at the same time sartorius provides a flexion at both and the apex of femoral triangle with structures will be damaged all the triangles and fossa are frequently asked femoral triangle femoral sheath adductor canal popliteal fossa they are frequently asked and the answer question asked among them is the relation of the structures that are present among them just like i told you about the cubital fossa the apex of femoral triangle it basically contains femoral artery and femoral vein you can see here Yeah, femoral artery and femoral vein they are present at the apex of femoral triangle adductor canal pus will compress now you again you should know the contents of the adductor canal if you know the contents you will find out that femoral artery and femoral vein both of them are present in the adductor canal now which one will be compressed whenever there is a pressure test veins due to the low pressure are compressed first so this will be the correct answer go ahead and read the contents of the adductor canal femoral artery femoral artery pulse is felt at the thing that about you have to memorize is it's present at the mid uh, inguinal ligament mid inguinal point your mid inguinal point so mid inguinal point um, it is actually a type of debate that is being fueled by bd chirasia and indian books actually they are not discussed in the brs and kaplan and even snell but uh, it is there you should know the difference between midpoint inguinal point and midpoint of inguinal ligament so here in the bd class it is at the mid inguinal point it is the point between anterior sphenic allic spine and pubic symphysis so mid inguinal point actually it is said here should be point mid inguinal point so here the femoral artery is present midpoint of inguinal ligament it is present between anterior sphenic allic spine and pubic tubercle so it is a little later to the uh, medial um, mid point of inguinal ligament it's actually a little later to the uh, mid inguinal point so the correct answer is i am giving here the reference so these wording the note as such accurate as it must have been much should have been so the correct answer would be mid inguinal point but honestly speaking the newer books the recent text they do not differentiate between the two but these this debate is being kept alive due to the our local books so we need to know why they are alive knee joint and the dislocation of finger on tibia the ligament damage is before going into the answer let me explain it to you a little bit so the answer is cruciate cruciate ligament but let me get into the um, understanding first so here you can see there is femur of tibia below this is the anterior aspect this is the posterior aspect so anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments you should know that their attachment is based on their attachment on the tibia the anterior cruciate ligament is attached anteriorly on tibia and posterior cruciate ligament is attached posteriorly on tibia and they have reciprocal attachments on the femur now if we look at their functions if we look at the functions of anterior cruciate ligament if the femur wants to go back on a fixed tibia it will be stopped by this anterior cruciate ligament so it prevents the posterior movement of femur on a fixed tibia similarly if femur is fixed and tibia if you try to pull tibia forward this ligament you can see its direction it gets tight it does not allow tibia to move forward so it prevents anterior movement of tibia on a fixed femur the reciprocal is true for the posterior cruciate ligament so posterior cruciate ligament is attached posteriorly onto the tibia and anteriorly onto the femur if a person if femur tries to move forward on a fixed tibia it gets stopped and it prevents the anterior movement of femur on a fixed tibia and reciprocally the same function it prevents the posterior movement of tibia on a fixed femur so these are its function i am telling you both of them of femur on tibia of tibia on femur because both of them are being asked frequently by the cpsb 
now what will happen if there is a lesion so now you know that how is their attachment and how is their lesion so what will happen is there is a lesion so we think that let's see if there is a lesion of anterior cruciate ligament it is torn there is no con no continuous connection between the two so if you try to pull the fever forward on a fixed tibia it will be stopped with the help of posterior cruciate ligament but for the same person if you try to push the femur back on a fixed tibia you will be able to do so because there is no anterior cruciate ligament to stop it so femur can now posteriorly on a fixed tibia now consider the tear of the same scenario from the tibia aspect if you try to push tibia back on a fixed femur you will not be able to do so due to the presence of intact posterior cruciate ligament but when you try to pull tibia forward on a fixed femur you will be able to do so because there is no intact anterior cruciate ligament to stop this is known as anterior draw sign tibia can be pulled anteriorly on a fixed femur so we are done with anterior cruciate ligament let's consider a tear in posterior cruciate ligament in posterior cruciate ligament is torn and you try to push the femur back on a fixed tibia you are not able to do so because of an intact anterior cruciate ligament but if you try to pull femur forward on a fixed tibia you are able to do so because the posterior cruciate ligament is not there to stop it this particular event is very important while moving down the stairs as the body is having its force in downward and forward direction a person with this tear his femur slips forward and a person usually cannot move down the stair due to that particular problem now the same scenario consider it from the tibia perspective if you try to pull tibia forward on a fixed tibia you are unable to do so because of an intact anterior cruciate ligament but if you try to push the tibia back on a fixed femur you are able to do that tibia can now be pushed posteriorly on a fixed femur that is known as posterior draw sign this is about the cruciate ligaments their function and lesions i hope it was more helpful than confusing moving on so the same question anterior dislocation of femur on tibia this is possible if you can dislocate femur anteriorly on tibia the lesion must have been the posterior posterior cruciate ligament here the posterior cruciate ligament is not drawn and uh, anterior cruciate ligament is unable to stop this movement trauma to the knee tibia is displaced anteriorly on the femur you see they are asking in both ways now anterior draw sign is positive that is due to the anterior cruciate ligament posterior dislocation of tibia over femur it is prevented by posterior draw sign is prevented by posterior cruciate ligament so these are all the functions i hope so uh, you must have a good idea about the cruciate ligaments now a foot is permanently dorsiflex and inverted which nerve is damaged uh, a good thing for you again the muscle functions are asked very frequently about the lower limb a good thing about you is that they are usually asked in form of groups anterior compartment lateral compartment posterior compartment but individual muscle functions are also asked you must know them also a foot is permanently dorsiflex and inverted it means that their reciprocal movements have been paralyzed what muscle causes the reciprocal movements what are reciprocal movements here if a person uh, is permanently dorsiflex it means the plantar flexion is paralyzed and inversion is paralyzed plantar flexion and inversion the these both functions are done by posterior compartment of the leg especially tbl is posterior the answer would be tbl nerve so tbl nerve uh, does uh, tbl nerve as a whole it supplies the plantar flexion of the foot to the gastrocnemius soleus and all the rest of the muscles and all the muscles that are going into the foot especially the tbl is posterior it helps is inversion of the foot so inversion is lost the foot will permanently go into the eversion 
a difficulty in medial movement of sole of the foot it means inversion inversion is not possible inversion is difficult while the lateral is fine lateral is mostly done by the peroneus muscles peroneus longus brevis tertius and medial is mostly done by tibialis muscles both by tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior so the answer is given here tibialis anterior and posterior you see tibialis anterior is going into the medial aspect of the foot when it raises it foot will get inverted and tibial is pushed here here it is shown the middle one of the three it attaches here on the medial aspect of the foot from the plantar aspect when it pulls it pulls the medial border of the foot upwards patient has sustained injury now can evert the foot but not invert exactly same question with a different sentence making tibial is anterior and tibial is posterior i cannot invert the foot again as tibial is anterior and tibial is posterior soleus muscle nerve supply posterior compartment of a leg is completely supplied by tibial nerve by the way a very good thing about leg is that all whole of the compartments are being supplied by same nerve anterior compartment of thigh femoral medial compartment of thigh obturator posterior compartment of thigh sciatic nerve tibial component for the most part and common peroneal for the short head of biceps posterior compartment of leg tibial nerve lateral compartment of leg superficial branch of common peroneal anterior compartment of leg tib branch of common peroneal a patient cannot dorsiflex the foot dorsiflexion is a function of anterior compartment anterior compartment is supplied by the deep peroneal so answer will be deep peroneal nerve plus sensation on the lateral side so here you can see that on the late uh, here this particular is confusing and i think this should be uh, corrected or removed maybe this is a recall bias or maybe there is a different so basically the deep peroneal nerve it supplies this web space between the big toe and the second toe so this uh, is not but dorsiflexion it's only the function of anterior compartment that is why i am giving the answer deep peroneal nerve but you should remember that this particular part of the question it is faulty because on the lateral side uh, on the lateral side it is not lateral most part of the foot is being supplied by the sural nerve that is uh, the branch of common peroneal main branch not the deep branch but good enough this is the answer that's uh, have uh, mm, fits the most sural nerve can be correct for only the later side of the nerve but sural nerve will not explain the dorsi flexion so uh, this uh, question is not very much intact in its um, integrity and that is why it leads to confusion and um, different answers but i am giving the preference to the dorsal flexion and giving the answer deep peroneal nerve the nerve involved in foot drop foot drop the foot is dorsal flexed with the help of anterior compartment and it is not the foot drop so the deep peroneal will be the better answer here uh, but again a uh, deep peroneal will be the better answer because anterior compartment is the one that is maintaining the foot drop but common peroneal can be totally accurate common peroneal nerve because when common peroneal nerve is damaged it has two branches superficial uh, superficial peroneal and deep peroneal so if only this information is given the nerve involved in foot drop both of them are absolutely correct common peroneal and deep peroneal both of them are correct because anterior compartment causes dorsiflexion and uh, posterior compartment lateral compartment it causes um, uh, eversion basically so if common peroneal is damaged uh, deep peroneal will be get damaged automatically but with actually what happens in cps exam questions in question like this some clue will be given regarding which options how uh, if the answer is that along with foot drop there is a loss of sensation only between the big toe and the second toe in this cleft in the first cleft then your answer will be deep peroneal if the answer is that with foot drop there is a loss of sensation on the lateral aspect of lower half of forearm and whole of the dorsum of the foot then your answer will be common peroneal so if only this information is given both answers are correct but for such question you should keep an eye on the second half there must be given some clue regarding the e version of the foot is e version of the foot is involved this means the superficial nerve is also involved leading to the common peroneal correct answer if whole of the dorsum of the foot is involved is only the first space between is involved so clues like this give an answer and please 
do not if you are given that do not fuss so much about getting only this statement a correct answer because this has both the correct answers and uh, people spend a lot of energy and time on why A is correct and why B is correct both of these are correct common peroneal injury will result in loss of eversion and dorsiflexion of the foot just as we discussed in the previous slide neck of fibula damage neck of fibula damage in the loss of dorsiflexion and eversion you can uh, see from both their clues the answer is dor common peroneal nerve and then the common peroneal nerve it winds around the neck of femur so it gets damaged uh, during its course if the neck of femur is fractured superficial simply lymphatics it is important for both the upper limb and the lower limb you should know at least know the lymphatics of thumb little finger dermatome of thumb little finger lymphatics of big toe little toe dermatome of big toe and uh, little toe the lymph node for the big toe is vertical group of superficial inguinal nerve big toe it goes with the help of with the saphenous vein and they go all the way up to the vertical group of superficial inguinal nerve from the little toe they go back in the small saphenous vein and they go into the popliteal nerves medial side of the knee great saphenous vein moves all the way on the medial aspect so they ultimately go into the vertical group of inguinal nerves thank you so much we are done our, with our video Uh, for more videos and updates follow our facebook page subscribe to our youtube channel and if you have any further questions suggestion objection or complaints regarding this topic or any other thing in general kindly post in the comments below or you can contact us on the contact information given on the page thank you so much inshallah see you on the next time allah hafiz good night